Representative Chasey, you have a proposal that would study whether New Mexico should institute paid parental leave. Why do you think we might need this? I think what the advantage is, is that it encourages families to participate in their children's lives, and I think it makes them more dedicated employees, healthier employees, healthier children, and so forth. We're the only developed country without paid parental leave. And of course, this is not mandating it. It's really asking for a group to form with stakeholders to look at whether it should be part of our public employee benefit package. Wouldn't that cost us a lot of money? Well, that's part of the idea, is to look and see what that would cost us. But this would look at the, um, at, at the dads and the moms having some time to bond with the child, and we know that's an important aspect in, in um, raising healthy children, children who are um, resilient. And I think it's one of those things that it would pay off in the long run, and so it's harder to, to prove the benefits. You have also introduced some legislation that would shift some of our attention in child abuse away from intervention to prevention. Well, I am an attorney and I practice law in the field of child abuse and neglect. I have a contract, I'm a court-appointed attorney in Cibola County and Valencia County. So I represent children who I've been taken into custody and I represent parents who've, um, whose children have been taken into custody in, in different cases. You don't, on the same case you have different um, members of the family you represent. But what I have come to realize is that the approach to dealing with a family by CYFD is very, very um, much the same with each family, although families vary greatly in their need for services. Some need a lot more help than others. And what I learned from our Legislative Finance Committee is that there are a number of states that have implemented a new model called either alternative response or differential response and it's aimed more at preventing child abuse and then having a more flexible approach allowing families to receive services before they actually enter into the legal system. So do you think this would save us money in the long run? Well ultimately that it would save us children and families. There would be more families reunited. Right now it costs us a hundred thousand dollars per child to go from the custody hearing all the way through the system to either adoption or reunification. I think it costs that much I think it costs more to do the adoption. I think that's where the um, what the the analysis has been of not the reunification with the family but that's expensive so I just think that uh, we need to be much more flexible in our thinking about how we can protect children and how we can restore families and how we can invest our money wisely in the state. Senator Kernan, you're one of the education experts here at the legislature and you have personal experience as a teacher tell us about that. I am a retired educator and I taught school for about 27 years. I tried to go back and figure that out the other day and uh, starting in 1969 and um, it was a great experience. I taught first grade and so uh, focused on, on the little ones for many, many, many years. And how are things different now from when you started in 1969? I can tell you how things are different, but I can also tell you how things are the same. And children basically are, ch are children. And uh, one of the things that I, I think that remains the same is that we need to make sure that we provide a good education for all children. And that's what I think we do in the state of New Mexico and in this country. So uh, that stays the same. Some things that are different, I think it's concerning to me as we um, um, evolve as a, a culture and as a country, I don't know that we really place the emphasis on the importance of education within our families and um, that is a grave concern to, to me and I think that's probably one of the things that we can't fix legislatively but it's something that we as a, a country and as a state and as a community we need to begin to focus on how can families be a part of that system. So what do you think are some of the biggest challenges that our families and communities are facing right now? So many parents both have to work and when uh, you, you send both parents out into the workforce when they come home in the evening 
everybody's tired. But yet, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, just whatever it would take to sit down, especially with young children, to spend time reading, uh, that's the number one thing that will get a child off on the, the right track. And how do you think we can best help families help their kids? I think that uh, we need to provide a secure place for them to go to school. And I think we've done some things legislatively that provides um, a good start to the day with the breakfast program. Um, I've supported that. Um, I think that's a very important piece. I think that um, uh, we want to make sure that uh, children are safe. And I know as our um, world evolves and things change in our community, we are doing some things uh, to make our schools more secure physically. And I think that's an important thing. When a parent drops off a child, they need to know that they're going to be safe at school. Um, so within the context of the parent, um, be available to uh, speak to teachers, uh, to have a good relationship between the schools and the parents. Make parents feel welcome. That's a very important thing. And you sit on the Education Committee. I do. I'm on Senate Education. I also serve on the Legislative Education Study Committee in the interim. So are there any specific proposals that you think would make a really big difference? I, of course, I'm carrying one of the um, reading intervention bills, and this is one of the governor's reform measures. My bill is a little bit different from the House version, and I did that um, uh, because it's what I believe in. I did a little bit of changing and um, may not uh, be in total agreement with uh, the, the House version. But I think that there is um, the appropriate time to really consider retention. And currently in our law, we do have mandatory retention. As people understand, the first year a parent can say, no, I don't want my child to be retained. But the second time a teacher goes to that parent, then there is a mandatory retention. I think my bill is better than current law because it offers so many opportunities for remediation, intervention, working with parents beginning in kindergarten through the SAP process if that child needs help, and then moving forward by the time the child uh, reaches third grade. Um, uh, the park test is given, and I want to recognize that that test is going to be very difficult for some children. So I have offered in my bill some opportunities for options. So if they don't do really well and they don't reach that lowest level of proficiency on, on the park or the SBA, then you have a chance to go to the teacher and look at a portfolio of that student or take another assessment. We don't want to retain kids, but on the other hand, there are some circumstances where when a child is truly not ready, we're doing them no favors by sending them forward. By the time they hit ninth grade, it's not up to whether the teacher wants to keep you back or send you forward. You've either earned the credits or you have not. And when you don't, you typically drop out of school. Senator Sabian, education is something that's really important to many families. Uh, you are the chair of the Senate Education Committee. Why is this important to you? Other than my elected position and now my appointed position as chair of Ed, I have three children myself. I have a 10-year-old, a six-year-old, and a four-year-old. All attend public school at Corrales Elementary, and so it's important to me for, that, for our educational system to be the most efficient and effective possible so that not only my children, but all the children in New Mexico uh, achieve success in life through their education foundation. As a lawmaker, what do you think are the most important things you can do to help families and children improve their lives? What I've done over the last seven years is I've listened to educators. I've listened to teachers on the ground. I've listened to principals, listened to superintendents on what the best practices are. Uh, we had 10 years of No Child Left Behind, which is utter failure in U.S. education policy. We understand the refocus on local governance we need to look at the foundational piece, that early childhood education piece. Too many times education's seen as K through 12. Then we developed pre-K, pre-kindergarten through 12. In reality, it's like anything else. Build a better foundation for the kids that are prenatal, zero through three, you get a better student coming into our pre-K and our kindergarten. But talking about, about zero decay, who do you think should bear most of the responsibility there? Is it the government or is it families? You know, I think, I think it's a, a public-private partnership. Um, you know, my wife and I were fortunate that we were able to reach our son, reach our daughters before they uh, hit that pre-K note. And as, you, as I would sit with teachers, those students who were prepared for pre-K and kindergarten, knowing their letters, knowing how to spell and to start to read, they were advancing further. But you still had students that didn't have that opportunity. 
Now, some would say, well, that's not government's responsibility. That's families' responsibilities. I agree wholeheartedly. But we have to realize in this day and age, especially in New Mexico, that we do have situations where mom and dad work two jobs each. The children are not read to all the time, not because the families don't want to, it's just time and energy. So my belief is, is it, it is a public-private partnership. I think it's incumbent upon the state to help families get their children prepared. Uh, talk to one of my kids, kindergarten teachers, that it takes a full six months to take those children who didn't have uh, early childhood ed, didn't have pre-K, weren't really prepared for kindergarten, it takes them six months to get level with the other students. Well, in a quintessential world, if all of our students are ready for kindergarten, that had the early childhood, that had the pre-K, we would move all those students up and have a six month uh, head start on everything. And then we move the students up to that next level rather than trying to catch these students up to where they should be. The intervention piece on early childhood, and that's why I've been a champion of early childhood since literally I was sworn in, that early childhood puts zero to three, then four year olds and five year olds. If we don't do a better job of creating an effective, robust system there, then we're gonna have the same results. And that's not a condemnation on K through 12. That's, to me, a message to everybody in New Mexico that if we do a better job, zero to five, then our teachers get a better student ready to learn and they're not having to do the remediation because we've done the intervention piece.